The global elite want you to be poor. I'm going to reveal why they want you to be poor and how they're going to try to achieve their objectives in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the history of energy consumption, global energy consumption. We've got a chart going all the way back to 1800 to today's date. On the left, we go from zero up to 180,000. This is terawatt hours. So this gives us an idea or a visual representation of not only how much energy we have used in the past and how much we're using now, but also what types of energy. So we go back to 1800 and it was about, let's say 10,000 of these terawatt hours. But as we get closer to today's date, especially starting about 1950, the energy usage globally grows exponentially. It goes parabolic. And you'll notice we add energy sources to the mix. So it starts off with biofuel. What is this? Basically dried cow dung. <laughs> Imagine going back and living in 1800 where that was your only source of energy. So if you had to cook dinner, well, honey, got to go outside, get some of that dried cow dung, or else we're going to have to eat that steak raw. <laughs> That's pretty much what it was like to live in 1800. Shocking that it was only 200 years ago. But then once we graduate from the cow dung, we go on to coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, and now more recently, green energy, renewable energy. And this is very important for the future. But this doesn't explain why the global elite want you to be poor. For that, we've got to dive deeper into the data. So let's think this through. We're dealing with energy that is a limited resource with alternative uses. We don't have an unlimited supply of oil, natural gas, coal as an example. And before we move on, editor, go ahead and throw up the chart. I want to point out that even though we have added more efficient sources of energy, we haven't gotten rid of the energy we used in the past. So as an example, today we're using almost as much biofuel, if you want to call it that, as we did back in the 1800s. We're using just as much coal, even though we discovered oil. And then we're using just as much oil now, even though we have natural gas, nuclear, and green energy. So you see how this works. We don't replace the prior source of fuel or energy. We only add to it. Very important detail. So since the world has experienced this exponential type growth in energy consumption, as you would imagine, the population has grown at the same rate. Editor, go ahead and throw up the chart that shows us the correlation between the two. So if our population continues to grow at the same rate, the next question would become, well, how do we have the exponential growth with a limited resource with alternative uses? So we've got this limited resource. What is our growth plan? Well, the global elite, this is obviously Bill Gates. <laughs> you see, he's holding a sign that says net zero by 2050. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But the global elite always talk about climate change and they talk about how bad fossil fuels are and the carbon emissions. They talk about replacing fossil fuels, but they never talk about increasing the amount of energy we have to support population growth and GDP growth. To give an example of what I'm referring to, let's look at Bill Gates's plan that he shares with the UN and the global elite, like the World Economic Forum and the IMF, to get to net zero by 2050. Editor, let's cut to the internet. Gates has released a new book detailing his plan to get to zero tons called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, The Solutions We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need. His breakdown of how we get to 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases each year puts goods production, as well as generating and transmitting electricity, at the top. The rest is divided among transportation, raising animals, forestry, and temperature control systems. 
Last year, Gates suggested the U.S. should create a national institutes of energy innovation to help the country take the lead in climate change innovation. But at the same time, he acknowledges that whatever developments come from the U.S. have to be affordable for other countries to actually implement. And the U.S. accounts for 14% of global emissions, so even if it managed to get to zero carbon emissions, there'd still be a long way to go. In a recent interview with Forbes, Gates says he has put $2 billion of his own money towards companies working towards zero emissions. Two of the more well-known ones he's backed are Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, both dealing with plant-based meats. His biggest bet has been on Terra Power, a nuclear power company with a reactor that uses depleted uranium as fuel. The company had been planning on building its first reactor in China, but the deal was blocked by the US government. Now the plan is to build a demonstration plant somewhere stateside, and the company received $80 million to do so from the Department of Energy. The other half will come from the private sector, mostly Gates himself. He's also created a fund called Breakthrough Energy Ventures and has investors such as Jeff Bezos, Vinod Khosla, John Arnold, and John Doerr putting in money towards zero carbon companies. So again, notice, they're not talking about increasing the amount of energy we have. They're talking about replacing the existing energy that we have. They're talking about renewables or green energy replacing nuclear, gas, oil, coal, and biofuel. So since they're talking about replacing the existing energy sources and not increasing them, this would imply that if we have continued population growth, that you are going to need to consume less. And this is where we start getting into why the global elite want you to be poor. Step number two. Now we need to dive deeper into the relationship between energy, the population, and GDP. Maybe more importantly, your standard of living. So the global elite look at the chart that we used in step number one, and they say to themselves, okay, I get it. We've got the energy usage going parabolic. This grows exponentially. The population doing the exact same thing. And then the population is supported by the additional energy. Therefore, the GDP or the standard of living can increase at the same rate or even a faster rate. But then they look at the types of energy we have and they say to themselves, okay, well, the majority of energy we have now is non-renewable. So this most likely is going to decline into the future. Well, luckily we have green energy. We're working on that, all the renewable energy, but this isn't going to grow that fast. So in their view, the renewable energy is only going to be able to make up for the decline in the non-renewable energy. This poses a big, big problem for them. Let's go over to these other lines so we can get our head around exactly what's happening here. Again, the red is population growth, black GDP, blue energy. So if we have this energy going up, or the amount of energy going up, the amount of energy we have access to, and then it starts to flatline because of what we see over here. This means that GDP will also flatline because energy is the economy. But if we continue to have population growth, then this means that the per capita GDP will go down, meaning the standard of living will decrease. So Klaus and all of his buddies at the IMF, the UN, the World Economic Forum, the Davos types like Bill Gates, they look at this and they say, well, I don't want my standard of living to go down. I want to consume just as much energy in the future as I'm consuming today. So let's look at this another way. We've got Klaus right here, obviously. And we've got everyone's favorite, the average Joe, representing all of us, all of you watching this video. So right now, Klaus, let's say, is consuming one barrel of oil per year. And let's say the average Joe is also consuming one barrel of oil per year. Well, if the population goes up and the amount of energy available does not go up at the same rate or goes sideways, that means that the per capita use of energy is going to have to decline. 
So in the future, Klaus can only consume maybe a half a barrel of oil. Same thing for the average Joe, because there's the same amount of energy, but there's a lot more people that need the energy or that are using the energy. Well, Klaus and Gates, they don't like this at all. So they say, no, 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 I want to continue to use the one barrel of oil per year, if not more. So this means that you, the average Joe, is going to have to consume a lot less. And in my opinion, this is what the global elite's narrative around climate change is all about. They don't care about the temperature in the ocean. They don't care about icebergs. They don't care about polar bears. The only thing they care about is their ability to consume the exact same or more energy in the future. And to do that, if the energy that we have access to flatlines, that means you are going to have to consume a lot less. So the whole net zero by 2050, or else the whole world is going to come to an end, is just a way to manipulate you to voluntarily lower your standard of living. If you lower your standard of living, you become poorer. And this is what the global elite want. I know a lot of you watching this video right now are probably looking at this chart and saying, well, wait a minute, if the population doesn't continue to grow and it flatlines and the energy flatlines at the same time while GDP flatlines and the standard of living isn't going to go down. So if we just reduce the population, problem solved. But don't you worry. The global elite, like Bill Gates, are one step ahead of you. Editor, cut to the clip. As we make the world healthier, is the population going to get so big that feeding everybody and maintaining the environment is going to be impossible? We go from less than a billion in 1800, and then three, four, five, six, and 7.4 billion where we are today. So Melinda and I wondered whether providing new medicines and keeping children alive, would that create more of a population problem? What we found out is that as health improves, families choose to have less children. So we've taken that chart that shows the global population growth, and we've actually extended it out all the way to 2100. And we can see that instead of continuing, it actually flattens out. Another way to see that is through this rate of population growth. And you can see that in the 60s, that reached a pretty high number, over 2% per year, and it's now come way, way down. Now, 11 billion people still a lot, but the good news is that the faster we improve health, the faster family size goes down, and so we can feel great about saving those lives. So we can feel great about saving people's lives. As opposed to what, Bill? Feeling guilty about saving people's lives because it's increasing the population? You see, once you sit down and really listen to what the global elite are saying, their objectives, their worldview becomes crystal clear. Well, let's get back to the video. Bill Gates explicitly says that higher populations are one of the world's biggest problems, and he wants to reduce the population in the future, or the population growth, as he says. But did you catch the part where he was talking about how if we improve health, then we will decrease the population? If you do a quick Google search, you'll realize that the correlation isn't necessarily between health and a lower birth rate. It's actually wealth. The more money people make, the more their standard of living improves, the lower the birth rate goes. Meaning, the wealthier they get, the fewer kids they have. I've got this line going back to 1800, and Bill Gates himself said that the peak of the birth rate was in 1960. That's when people globally were having the most amount of kids. Therefore, that would imply that in 1960, the health rate was far lower than it was in 1800. So is Bill Gates wanting us to believe that health declined 
from 1800 to 1960? <laughs> Absolutely not. 1960 was not the pinnacle of poor health globally. Therefore, even if you don't do a Google search, this really doesn't make a lot of sense. So if the global elite realize the way you get people to voluntarily decrease the birth rate is to increase the amount of wealth. But wait a minute. If we increase the amount of wealth, we have to increase the amount of energy consumption. And if we can't increase the amount of energy consumption, then we need to figure out a different way to reduce the population. So maybe this video shouldn't be titled, The Global Elite Want You Poor. Maybe it should be titled, The Global Elite Want You Dead. But we'll go ahead and save that topic for another video. I wouldn't want to go off on some wild conspiracy theory based on the things the global elite are actually telling us right to our face on YouTube. So the next question, let's go back to the topic at hand, is why the global elite look at this chart and say, okay, well, the non-renewable energy that we have access to might decline in the future, but why can't the free market figure out a way to utilize the energy we do have at a greater capacity, therefore, solve this problem? I'm gonna reveal the answer to you throughout the rest of this video, along with the real solution to this problem per my favorite economist, Milton Friedman. Step number three, central planning Malthusians versus free market capitalists. Or another way to look at this is Klaus Schwab versus Milton Friedman. So we start this step by having to go back in time. Let's go through a story of how we got to where we are today as far as the global elite's worldview. Starts in 1800 with Thomas Malthus. This is really the first person that became popular by discussing how the world has a finite amount of resources and therefore, if the population continues to increase, like we talked about in step number one, we would have a big problem. So fast forward to 1968, and this is when the Club of Rome was founded by Aurelio Pecci and Alexander King. And this is gonna be important here in just a moment. And just fun fact here, one of their founding members was none other than Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's, well, supposedly Justin Trudeau's father. But the Club of Rome was really just a bunch of Malthusians that were really trying to just rebrand the ideas that he had back in the 1800s. Then in 1971, Klaus Schwab starts the World Economic Forum. It wasn't called that back then. I think it was still in Davos. But this is where it all began. Then in 1972, the Club of Rome comes out with a paper that became extremely popular worldwide called The Limits to Growth. And again, this was just repackaged ideas from Thomas Malthus saying that we have limited resources and therefore we need to intentionally reduce the population growth and intentionally reduce the consumption of those resources. And when I say this paper gained international recognition, I wasn't joking. In fact, some MIT scientists took these ideas and tried to plug it into a computer to figure out when the world would come to an end. I actually found a YouTube video on this. Editor, let's cut to the clip. It's not some science fantasy effect from 2001. This electronic display emanating from Australia's largest computer is a picture of the condition past, present and future of planet Earth. The program was originally devised by a scientist working from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Jay Forrester. It was developed under the auspices of the Club of Rome by an MIT research team to present a complex model of the world and what we humans are doing to it. The program, called World One, doesn't pretend to be a precise forecast. What it does for the first time in man's history on the planet 
is to look at the world as one system. It shows that Earth cannot sustain present population and industrial growth for much more than a few decades. It shows that simply cleaning up our car exhausts and making some small effort to limit our families simply isn't enough. As population increases, the quality of life decreases and the supply of natural resources decreases. But have a look at this curve here. This is called the Z curve and it represents pop uh, pollution. Now, predictably enough, as the population increases up to 1980, pollution increases. There's more rubbish. But from 1980 to the year 2020, pollution really takes off. This is assuming, of course, that we don't do anything about it. So the year 2020, the condition of the planet be starts to become highly critical. And if we don't do anything about it, this is what's going to happen. The quality of life is going to go right back to practically zero. Pollution is going to become so serious, right out here, that it will start to kill people. So the population will diminish. Right back here, less than it was in the year 1900. And at this stage, round about the year 2040, 2050, civilized life as we know it on this planet will cease to exist. So then in 1973, Aurelio Pecci, which by the way, if you watch the entire clip, that entire YouTube video, they actually interview him about midway through. But he gave a speech at the World Economic Forum, the Davos Summit, held by none other than Klaus Schwab. And his keynote speech was about the limits to growth. So since that time, pretty much everything that you read from Klaus Schwab has really echoed the ideas of the Club of Rome and Thomas Malthus going back to 1800. Now we fast forward to today, actually we've got to stop at 1991. Uh, the Club of Rome still existed in 1991. In fact, they still exist today. But they came out with another paper that said that yes, we have all these problems, but we can't expect the solutions to come from the free market. We can't expect individuals to solve these problems. In fact, we can't even depend on states or countries, governments, to solve this problem. We have to have a global unified approach, meaning we have to have a global elite that have the power, a one world government, to tackle these problems. Then we fast forward to today, and like I said, the Club of Rome still exists. And they have this idea that they announced to the world in 1991. I think they had that idea going back to 1968. But they announced it in 1991 that they're really superior to everyone else. You all are just dumb rubes in the real economy. You are inferior to the global elite, the intelligentsia, the enlightened few. Therefore, they should have all the power and the control for the greater good, of course. And to give you an example of what I'm referring to, let's go ahead and cut to another clip. And this is from a presentation from one of these members of the current day Club of Rome, where she talks about the group, the Club of Rome, having achieved a higher level of consciousness. So there is, um, that's how I did my PhD, and this is what my research uh, showed, that there is a significant number of us who are actually reached, have reached higher levels of consciousness where the integration of all of these things comes natural. So you don't need, like, like all the people, every single one in this room already does this. So this is actually the wrong audience for this presentation. So once you understand the global elite, like the World Economic Forum, the UN, IMF, Club of Rome, once you understand they're all Malthusian, they have this worldview, and they have a view that they are superior and you are inferior, everything they do and say really starts to make sense. And their objectives become crystal clear. Number one, reduce consumption of resources. Number two, you've got to limit population growth or maybe even decrease population growth. And then number three, they need to have all the power and the control. So is it any surprise that they want you to be poor so they can continue to be rich? Or as my good friend, Dr. Chris Martinson says, they want you to take cold showers 
so they can continue to fly around the world in their private jet. So I know a lot of you are watching this video right now and saying, okay, George, I get it. These people are completely psychotic, insane, and their quote unquote solutions will only make things worse. So what should we do? What is the actual solution? Well, for this answer, we go right back to this guy, Milton Friedman, who actually addressed the Club of Rome's paper, Limit to Growth, back in the mid-1970s. And the solutions he outlined back then obviously worked very well. So I see no reason why those same solutions wouldn't work just as well today and into the future. Editor, let's cut to the clip. It is what you might call the difference between the economic way of thinking and the engineering way of thinking. The broader problem is very much epitomized by the famous Club of Rome report, Limits of Growth, which got so much attention a few years ago. You will all recall that that was a report in which engineers were saying, we have finite resources, a finite amount of coal, a finite amount of space, and so on and so on. Things grow at exponential rates, and so long as things grow at exponential rate, they're ultimately going to become infinite. And since resources are finite, we're going to bump into it, and therefore we are faced with a terrible future in which sooner or later we're going to run out of steel or coal or whatever you want to name we're going to run out of. <clears throat> and we really have to adjust our sights. We can no longer take the view that we can have growth forever. <clears throat> in, the, in this country, in the 1920s, there was a great uproar about the fact that the total volume of reserves of petroleum available would only last 10 or 20 years. Today, the total volume of reserves, of known reserves, is higher than it has ever been, not only in absolute barrels, but relative to an, a, a year's consumption, relative to the population. How can that... What's true in the case of oil is true in the case of all of these other natural resources. Invention, discovery, innovation has made, has enabled us to discover substitutes for natural resources. We cannot get out of the problem by being able to predict things that are not predictable. That the right conclusion is that the crystal ball is inevitably cloudy. That that is the nature of the world we live in that all specific predictions about the precise amount of this, that, or the other deserve skepticism. That what we need is not the kind of specific, detailed blueprint for the future that Huffman and Nehring would like to produce. That what we need is an adjustment mechanism that will enable us to adapt to what happens as it develops. And of course, as everybody in this room knows, there is such a system, namely the price mechanism, which successfully steered us over several centuries from wood to coal to whale oil to petroleum to natural gas. That is a mechanism in which you, it is in the self-interest of hundreds and thousands and millions of people to make their best guesses about the future, in which it's unnecessary to have a single blueprint in which you have an automatic adjustable mechanism as things develop. And we can see going back to that chart in step number one, if we look at the 1970s, compared to how much energy we have today, Milton Friedman was spot on. So why does the free market work so well in solving these types of problems? It's actually very simple. As the price goes up, people naturally consume less they don't need a central planner like Klaus, the World Economic Forum of the Club of Rome, or Bill Gates, <laughs> to tell them to do this. It's a natural process. And as the price goes up, what happens to innovation? It increases. So if we just let the free market work, maybe the price of oil would be higher. Maybe the price of coal would be higher but that would incentivize the 7 billion people in the world to try to figure out a solution. 
But what the central planners are doing now is they're trying to manipulate the market in order to buy votes. And this is going to create more economic distortions, more misallocation of resources, and malinvestment. And this decreases the probability that we find a truly sustainable solution moving forward, which would allow for population growth, additional energy consumption, and for GDP, the standard of living for not just the rich, but the poor and middle class globally to continue to increase. So the problem is the central planning Malthusians that think they're just better than everyone else. The solution is good old fashioned free market capitalism. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks, and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.